workforce and earning divides in the AAPI community from New American Economy and, Leader and the Leaders Forum. Today, one in three Asian American and Pacific Islanders were born in the United States, even though immigration from Asia remains significant. In fact, the U.S.-born AAPI population is now growing faster than the AAPI immigrant population. Another fact, nearly half or 45 percent of all foreign-born Asian American and Pacific Islanders have lived in the United States for more than 20 years. A remarkable statistic given that before the Immigration and Naturalization Act of 1965, immigration from Asia was highly restricted due to racially discriminatory country quotas. Another fact, there are more than 10.7 million Asian American and Pacific Islander eligible voters in, in the United States. Together, they make up 4.7% of all eligible voters in the country. Texas, home to an increasingly prominent AAPI population, now has the third largest AAPI electorate in the country, with more than 736,000 eligible AAPI voters. And in fact, within the city limits of Fort Worth, our census has shown that AAPI is one of our fastest growing demographics. So now, more than ever, we must condemn anti-AAPI violence and racism and lift up our AAPI residents by honoring their rich histories and cultures and celebrating the many ways they make our communities stronger. And to that end, I am pleased to present today's program, Lost in the Sauce with Hao Tran, a Vietnamese culinary demonstration and story of immigration. Hao Tran Thank is a mother. So Thank you, Veronica. I'm excited to be here. Um, I mean, Fort Worth is my home, and to be able to share my stories through food, through my culture, um, it's really an honor to be here. Um, and I see a lot of maybe hungry faces in the audience, um, I, so I don't want to keep, keep you. I know we have a little bit of time, uh, or time limit. So uh, I'm going to talk as we go through this, um, but if you want to get started and serve one of the most traditional um, dishes of Vietnam. It's a uh, pho, and I know that there's all different kinds of pronunciations with that, um, and you just have to, you just have to roll it with it. Just pho. You know, it uh, it's, comes from the French. Um, when the French were kind of bougie and they were, you know, eating the nice fillets and cuts of beef that's um, more, you know, high-end, um, they discarded all the leftovers and all the bones and whatnot. Um, so the Vietnamese, uh, Indochina back then, um, said, you know what, we'll take that. And on the streets, they put all these discards, the bones, um, you know, and put it in, into a big pot with seasonings. And it was magic. Uh, I swear, I think they, this uh, cures cancer at times, because uh, when I'm sick, when I... Uh, drink one of these or my grandmother made it uh, when we were little um, it was just so soothing and so comforting um, so the name pot au feu is, means uh, pot of fire so this pot has been cooking since yesterday at nine o'clock so it took about I guess 18 hours um, to make this uh, this soup and I did use soup bones um, I also use oxtail because it's, it's a great way to sweeten the broth very naturally. Um, beef shanks, uh, you can use brisket. I also did um, short ribs. Whatever meat you have. Um, the higher end meats, of course, sweetens the broth, but it's not about the broth. It's about the seasonings. And, um, and I brought them with me. I make my own mix, but you can go to the Asian market and get these prepackaged mixes. And there's six magical spices in here. Um, and if I can show you in smell and all that, but there's definitely cinnamon, anise, um, this uh, licorice bark, some coriander, um, and cloves, uh, and fennel. So it's, it's like this mix, and it somehow just magically um, makes a wonderful uh, aroma um, and it blends so well together. Um, the first step in making something like this is to roast your bones and roast your meat. Um, it's a wonderful process where you kind of cleanse all the debris away from the, the bones. 
it kind of seals it. You don't want all the, the gritty in your broth. Um, then make your broth. It takes, I wait about eight hours before I season anything. I add in charred ginger and onions. Um, and then the magic, the seasoning packet. This is a seasoning packet that I made um, yesterday and this entire packet went to this broth um, and it, it cooked overnight. So I hope you, you smell it and taste it and, and enjoy that, um, that aroma. The second part of, of what I wanted to show you today is making spring rolls. Also another traditional um, sort of an appetizer and it's fresh. Um, we, we love using fresh herbs, um, fresh um, mango, cucumbers, mints. So I wanted you to have the hands-on experience in doing it. So right in front of you, you have rice paper and you're thinking, uh, how am I gonna eat this? It's not as nice and crunchy. You're not, you're actually gonna soak it in the water that's in front of you. So take one, and just wet it just nice and coat it with water and it's i promise it's going to be very malleable after that okay i'm going to grab a chopping board all right and you have a plate oh she's going to grab you some water does she, does she need water right here? Okay, okay. All right, let it sit for just a moment um, and so that it kind of, you know, settles down and it'll soften up. Um, now, if you want to just use veggies, you can. If you want to use the traditional shrimp, you can. This is all so, so very flexible. I love to do a summer one where there's um, strawberries and mangoes and kiwi. It's, it's a nice fruit one, um, but it's, it's a preference, whatever you like. So I'm gonna start mine with the little shrimp and I'm gonna lay my pretty side of the shrimp, the pink side, right on the edge of the, um, the rice paper. I'm just gonna use a couple of them. And if you can't see, and I, I see do, uh, someone has uh, maybe soaked their rice paper a little bit too long, but that's okay. Get another one. We have plenty. Um, you know, if it's not going to work for you or it's too too soft, just get another one and, and just kind of wet it again. It's no, no big deal. All right, so here's where all the layers are. You're going to grab your mango, your mince, your lettuce, and of course I didn't get myself any. Here, get that. And this is local lettuce, by the way. Um, I was able to sweet talk my way through a farmer and give me his fresh lettuce um, this past weekend. So I saved it just for you. Um, so take your mint leaves and lay it on top with your cucumber and your mango, a little bit of lettuce. Now you're wondering, um, why do I have noodles in front of me? Now, traditionally, we do put noodles in there, but I found a little secret. You can mess with a bunch of noodles where it's like bulk, or you can use, um, I'm sorry, these little vermicelli noodles that are these, uh, they lay down really nicely for you on your rolls. So just put one of those on there, okay? And then you're gonna start from the left and from the right and just start tuck and roll. My grandmother could do this like with her little nimble fingers so tight. I, I, like, I don't know how she did it. So I'm still practicing, but I'm gonna just tight, tight, tight. And if my is too nimble, my paper is too nimble, I'll do it again. But I think I got it here. <laughs> I always get excited when it turns out all right. 
Now, if it falls apart, that's okay. You, you did a deconstructed spring roll, uh, and then we'll do another one. But yeah, once you have it, just give it a cut, and you'll have a couple of sides there to work with. Now, the, since these rice papers, um, they're about eight inches. We don't want to overfill, but if you know, you've got a nice nimble uh, rice paper, that works too. And I see some really pretty ones out there. Awesome job. Now, how would we eat these? <laughs> There's a lot of excitement over there. <laughs> I think we're doing good. You're doing great. Doing great. Now, I'm going to show you how to make a sauce that goes with these spring rolls. It's a peanut sauce. And what I've done is just to get some creamy peanut butter and some hoisin, which you're going to use in your pho broth as well, some soy sauce, and I've put a little bit of chili in there, but not much, because I don't want you guys to get, you know, get, make it too hot for you. And then I also did uh, some almond milk. Um, because this is going to be completely be, uh, vegetarian or vegan. And just mix. Now, if I were doing this at home, I would use a food processor because it's much easier. Um, but this would work just fine. You want to mix it so it's nice and smooth. And then I'm going to pass it around and you're going to use it as a dipping sauce for your spring rolls. Now you're asking, how, how long have you been here? Um, you might have a Texas twang to you. Um, I came here when I was six. Um, we immigrated in 1975, the fall of Saigon. Um, my father was in the military and we, we had a run. Um, and what you see on television where it was chaos in Vietnam um, at the airport, it, it's true. It was awful um, and when the Afghanistan incident happened and the refugees were coming here, um, it just kind of brought back some memories of that time. Now, six years old, I don't know what was going through my mind, but I know my parents were pretty petrified. I just felt like I was on an adventure. Um, we got on a C-130 airplane, one of those cargo planes, and it was packed. We were packed in there like sardines. Um, quite hot in there because it's you know it's a metal. It's all metal. Um, but I remember this GI. Um, he handed me something out of a little packet, and he he showed me you know to put it in your mouth and chew it. Um, I'm like, okay. Um, and it turned out to be chewing gum. It's like little chiclets. And um, of course I swallowed it because I didn't know. <laughs> but um, that's my first memory of, of what's, what's happening in this adventure I was on. Um, we went to, to camp, to refugee camp, and we had free reign because, you know, we kind of were locked in. And it was uh, my first experience because we never had television in Vietnam. Um, we. You know, we just, there is like maybe one channel on, on the radio, um, but um, at, in refugee camp, there was movies, guys, the big screen. They would show movies, um, 
you know, like at night, like it's a big sheet, and it was like mash. It was like watching Doris Day and Cary Grant and, you know, Pillow Talk. And it was my first experience to American culture watching these movies, these 1950s movies in the, in the 70s. And, um, oh, I totally fell in love with Cary Grant. Um, peanut sauce. So I'm going to pass these around, and you guys can, you know, kind of dip some in your, your plates, okay? All right. So the phone line, this is how it's going to work. You're going to get started, so that way you can eat and uh, enjoy this. Grab some noodles, you know, put it in your little bowl here. I thought there were tongs over here. We'll use this one. Now, these are fresh noodles. Um, I, I splurge. You can also use dry noodles. They keep for a long time in your cupboard. Um, this is my favorite brand. This is the Three Ladies brand. Um, it's always a, a, like a staple in my house. You actually have to cook these. You have to soak them first in warm water. They'll get a little malleable. But then um, you have to boil them for like three to five minutes, not too long. Don't overboil because it'll get really soggy. Um, so grab your noodles here, and the broth, the hot broth, is going to cook your noodles. And I'll ladle some broth over your noodles, and you can garnish with um, fresh sprouts, some basil, Thai basil, scallions. Now the, I did cut some jalapenos and lime if you are adventurous and like some spice to you. And then there are uh, hoisin, sriracha, and a little soy, whatever you like. Um, I didn't know everybody's, ta everybody's taste, so you fix yourself. And then I see that you're already chowing down on some of those spring rolls. And those are some really pretty ones. <laughs> There's a, wow, he's got a really nice and firm one there. Nice job. <laughs> so anyway, um, Actually, I'm a high school science teacher. I teach here in, uh, in Fort Worth ISD. Uh, I've been a teacher for over uh, 25 years. Um, I raised two daughters here in the, the U.S. and they just, um, they're my life. I mean, they, you know, K through 12, right here in Fort Worth ISD. Um, one is, uh, is an engineer, the other one is a CPA. They got their math and science from me, not from their dad. So, um, no, they, they are uh, just wonderful kids. Um, I don't know if you were, I don't know if you follow me on social media or not. Uh, Fort Worth ISD did something that is uh, pretty amazing. Uh, and being the first to, of its kind, we started a all-girls football team. Um, and this was the inaugural year, and you know the crazy person in me said, "Hey, sign me up to be the coach," because um, I really didn't know much about football. I just wanted to learn. Um, and half my girls were athletes; the other half were not. Um, and they they actually had a, such a winning season. We we went to the playoffs last night, and like one. So it was an amazing, um, I, I speak on behalf of all women who like think you can't do something, you can. I mean, you absolutely can. And um, being an Asian American here, it's, it's a community driven by maybe some, some suppression uh, and some bias. And I just feel that, you know, Whatever we can do to encourage the, um, you know, the abilities of all women, whether they're Asian or black or Hispanic, um, I just believe in that um, it should be uh, it should be open to, to all. Um, so I had to, you know, f fill that in a little bit. Um, my parents, my parents, um, my father, like I said, was in the military. He was a captain of the South Vietnamese Navy. Um, my mother was also a, a, a trailblazer herself. Uh, she was a, a 
person that was driven by education. She grew up very poor and had no means to get past fifth grade. Um, but she worked her way where she got into college. And the first college in Vietnam was Marie Curie Nursing School. Uh, and I think maybe some of you might know Marie Curie. She was a nurse back like in the uh, 30s and 40s and made some, like she got the Nobel Prize. Um, but my mother went to school there and became um, a midwife. Um, and being the youngest, I was able to go with her and some of her, you know, adventures, I guess out, I wouldn't say adventures, it was pretty bad out in the, the front uh, during the war. Um, my brother and my sister was our, were already in school, but she had to take me along with her, and it, and it was tough. Um, you know, the American soldiers were, uh, you know, they were injured, and um, they asked, you know, everyone out there to take care um, of the soldiers. And, um, you know, it, war is never a, um, never a, a thing you want to see, uh, especially the people who um, have to fight in the war. And, you know, if I had had a son, um, I guess I, I would be proud if they wanted to, to you know, be in the military, but it, it really scares me. And, you know, if you're a veteran and if you are someone who's, you know, fought in a war, have family fought in a war, I truly respect um, that because um, it's a tough one. You're away from your family. Um, and you're making sacrifices for people, you know, for, the, for your country that uh, really no one sees. You, you don't really see that. Um, so I can talk on and on, so I'm going to let you guys come up here, serve yourself the soup, uh, and then you can come back and I'll, I can share some more stories. I did make dessert for everybody. Um, the dessert is a mix of coconut, lychee, and jackfruit. Um, if you're not familiar with jackfruit, well, you'll get to try it today. Um, so that's here, ready for you. <laughs> Thank you. The dessert goes in there. Yeah, I can eat all this too, Veronica. Oh man, it's so easy to make. You saw me. Yeah, I'll go. <laughs> uh, just enough to fill the bowl, because it'll, it'll um, cook down. Yeah. The fish sauce is in there, right? Here? Yes. And you can't. Shrimp? Yes. Yes, I should have made it. But no, I made a vegan one. I'm sorry. No worries. <laughs> yep, you would definitely um, have have. Yeah. And then you get to garnish whatever you like over there. There you go. It's hot, very hot. Very hot. No mushrooms. Yes, ma'am. There you go. It's very hot. You just want to taste? Yes, ma'am. Have you had this before? Uh, yes, with a little boy. You're you're all in. I'm like, uh, yes. <laughs> Wait, your your name is a lot of, a lot of paperwork that I get. It is. It is. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Almost you get a, a stamp. <laughs> it's very hot. Very hot on the sides there. Yeah. Thank you so much. So the noodles that stayed in their little form, did they come that way? Yes. You just have to soak it in, in, in water. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah, the bulk noodles are just so, you know, like all over, and like this one just lays down nice and flat.
perfect. Just to tell you guys a story, since I still have the mic on me, um, going to school, you know, as a newly person in, the, in this country, not knowing a word of English, I, uh, I came in and we had very limited clothing. We were just what, what we had. And so I had this little outfit with little chickens on it. And I'm little, my grandmother sewed this outfit. And um, they sent me home from school because they thought I was wearing pajamas. Um, and now I see kids in high school, wait, you are wearing pajamas. Uh, <laughs> yes, it's very hot, baby. Yeah, it's very hot. Oops, I just lost my spoon. Um, let me see if I can grab it. Ooh, there it is. Here we go. Have you had this before? Awesome. And it's going to be very hot in the bottom, so I would um, hold it on the sides. There you go. Now, what can you do? With these noodles, if you have so much left over, well, what I would do is make a stir fry, some pad thai um, with these uh, fud noodles. Oh, wonderful. You know, I'm gonna get that one up right up there, yeah. Thank you. It's super hot, so you wanna hold it on the side. There you go. Now, I think the idea of, of race that we struggle with, whether we're Asian or we're you know, Hispanic or black, is just we have to teach our kids to be aware that there is no separation. Um, and while I was in school, I was always afraid to ask questions because you know, I, culturally I was taught not to speak speak up and um and so finally one teacher told me you know how it's okay to ask questions and um and so once i started asking questions i was learning so it's wonderful <laughs> yeah you, <laughs> it's okay <laughs> here we go it's gonna be very hot so be careful I would hold it to the side of the bowl here. You're welcome. Almost didn't make a mess. Yeah. You look familiar. I don't know. Do, you, do I know you? What's your name? My name's Aminda. Aminda? No? I just started here about a month ago. Oh. But I went to school in Fort Worth, but I don't know if it's the same. Did you, which high school? Pasco. What year did you graduate? 2016. You graduated the same year my daughter did. Camille Brown, uh, Hannah Brown, uh, no, maybe she graduated in 16. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I was an uh, instructional coach there at Pascal. An instructional coach? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Ty Basil. Yes. How are you? Hey, I knew nothing about football either when I first came here. Oh gosh! I went to the first football game. I saw them hitting each other. I was like, I want to play that. Right? Like, Isn't it fun well, though? And I was like, you know, I played for four years. Here we go. It's hot, so it holds up on the side there. Mm -hmm. So what school are you at? I'm at Jamal Tech. I saw we came in third place on the. We laptop. did. We sure did. <laughs> I saw that when you said that. I was like. She's talking about my alumni. Yep. Yes, 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 yes. I'm so proud. I was excited. I was like, look yeah. at that. <laughs> I saw some of the volleyball girls and basketball. Yep. A couple of them. Yeah, the basketball them. girls, half of, half of them came on to yes, the football. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. That was cool. Yeah. Y'all, I've made so much. There was plenty for seconds and thirds, I think. <laughs> How are you, sir? Good. Have you had this before? No. Oh, oh well, there you go. Hold it on the side so it won't be so hot there. How are you? 
Have you had this? I always uh, get something different. I yeah. go to, uh, I like Milan. Oh yeah, they, they do good. Number 16, it's like a rice platter. Yeah. But, uh, I'll try it now. Yeah, good, good. Well, this bub is like a, like a marriage of aroma and spices. And I hate to say this, or I, it's love. That's love that goes into a pot. Every pot that I make, um, it's not about like how much is in there or what, how, you know, percentage wise or recipe. It's just, I cook the way my grandmother taught me how to cook. Uh, and I know probably plenty of you have that experience, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. very hot. Oh, yes. Y'all, I'm so excited. Um, a few years ago, um, I met um, my business partner, Diksha, and we started doing a dumpling business, dumpling pop-ups all over town. Um, and then we had some mutual friends, um, Trent and Dina Chaskin, and Trent makes the best sourdough in town. And I, I, that's not an exaggeration. It's wonderful sourdough bread. We opened a store called The Table, which is not too far away from here. Um, and we are one of our first employees that you have here, which is who, where is she? Kimberly Castro, she's one of my students. She was a sophomore when I hired her and she is fantastic. Um, but The Table is a local foods market um, that carries you know, people who farm, like this lettuce that you're eating, um, meats that are butchered here in Texas. And what was lacking was a sit-down place to eat. And, uh, and so Hal, in her old age here, decides to open a restaurant. Um, so I'm opening a restaurant at the end of summer called The Pantry. And it's right on Magnolia, right next door uh, to Shinjuku. It's the old hot damn tamales place. So be on the lookout for that. I'll be serving pho and bun mi sandwiches, and of course, our dumplings. Um, we're hoping to be the first dumpling house in Fort Worth, um, so where you can get soup dumplings and pork dumplings. It's very hot, babe. Yeah. So I hope you come by and see us at the end of summer. Um, I'm, I'm a spoiled teacher. I love my summers, and so I do take a little break and I'm gonna take this break and go to Paris for two weeks because I'm, I signed up to go to La Cordon Bleu and to learn how to do pastries for the summer. So I'm gonna come back and do croissants, do baguettes for you. Um, so I'm really excited about that. It's like a learning and a fun experience for the summer. Um, so yes, I still teach um, during the day and I still I do this cooking thing at uh, events at night. Um, people ask me, how do you ever sleep? And I, I slept two hours last night because I had to babysit this a little bit. Um, and it's, it's, but if I didn't love it, I wouldn't do it. And I truly love it. And I think the, that my legacy is maybe cooking for people. Um, if anything, um, I leave behind and I hope that the people I feed are, are happy and, um, you know, remember that they had a good meal. So it's very hot, baby. Very hot. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about the connection between French um, cuisine and Vietnamese cuisine? Absolutely. Um, so growing up, my, my parents, you know, were fluent in French. Um, my mother would read French stories to me, um, all the fables. Um, but the food that is ingrained, and of course, Julia Charles is one of my, my heroes, um, it's, it's very similar. We have the same phrases, we have the same um, taste. Um, we just took it um, in a different flavor profile. Um, for example, crepes. Um, you know, you know, you know, egg crepes and, but the Vietnamese, we use rice crepes. Um, and if you ever had uh, the crepes, they're called uh, bun xèo, which is a sizzling rice cakes um, or crepes. 
They are filled with sprouts and mints and pork and shrimp. Um, they look just like a, a French crepe, but it has no egg in it, and it looks so tricky. They make the color using turmeric, uh, the yellow color, and it's so good for you. That's why we probably eat, you know, live to a thousand years old um, using these, uh, these spices. Um, but when I go to friends, um, there's also another reason uh, besides, you know, learning how to cook pastries. Um, my grandfather, culturally, was, this was acceptable, had three wives. Um, I think two were concurrent, you know, you know how that goes. Um, and so he had a, 16 children, and all the children got along, and they, they, you know, connected with each other. So for the first time when I go to Paris this time, um, I'm going to meet one of my uncle's um, that has never met any of my father's children. So he is very excited and to meet, you know, an offspring of, of his brother, because um, my parents passed away uh, quite a bit ago. Um, so I'm hoping, you know, to get some stories. Um, he said that, you know, he knew my father as a child, so it was, uh, you know, it, you know when you, when your parents have been long gone and you, you hear people tell stories, you, you're like, you want to get emotional and cry and all that, but it's, it's going to be fun. Um, and he lives in Normandy, um, which brings me back, why normally, right? So I actually been training as a pilot. And, um, and so about eight years ago, I started training to be a teacher astronaut, and um, I started learning about aircrafts. And you have a beautiful aircraft here in Fort Worth, the C-47, um, and it's hangered out at Meacham. It's a vintage World War II airplane, and it's got Susie on it, you know, Susie with the blonde, and, um, and I'm flying that next week. And this plane, this plane is, is raising money to go back to Normandy in two years. So I'm doing a special fundraising dinner um, June 1st with them so that, you know, every little bit helps. They need like $48,000 to get the plane to Normandy. Um, if you haven't seen this plane and you haven't ridden this plane, look it up because they still take people for rides. And um, I took one at Christmas to see the, Christ you know, the lights and all that over Fort Worth. It's, a, it's comfortable. It's so, you think it's a big metal thing but they had seats in there and the, there's portholes so you can look out. But the plane is, a, is beautiful. Um, it's, it's anything that has retained that history. Um, it's a wonderful thing that, you know, that, you know, Meacham Airport's able to, to give them the space to, to keep the plane out there. Um, I would check that out. Um, but yeah, I, I'll be going to Normandy for a couple of days and uh, experiencing the food there, I, as I understand, it's on the beach, of course, you know, but so there's a lot of seafood. And I can't wait because I love, love seafood. I love anything related to the sea. Um, I, I told my, my kids that, you know, don't bury me, please throw me out to the, the ocean. And I don't care what gets me, but just throw me out to the ocean. Um, so I'm walking around here, I'm, everything looks pretty good. You guys are kind of quiet, so it, maybe it's a good sign. <laughs> yes, yes. Escargot, is it Vietnamese or French? It's French, for sure. But we, we do eat escargot differently um, in Vietnam. We use the periwinkle, the little, uh, little bitty ones. And my mother would cook like a huge pot of it, and we, it's communal, and you sit there and you have these little toothpicks, and you you get them out, and I mean, there's not much like there's nothing, there's nothing to them, but we dip it into a ginger fish sauce, uh, whereas the escargot, the French escargot, is a little bit more meaty, garlic, butter, it, that's good too. Um, so very very good observation that we um, there's some similarities in that. Um, food wise. Um, the spring rolls, egg rolls. It's such a common thing. Um, you know, it's, this, is, this would be considered street food. 
um, in Vietnam. Um, you go by Stan. I mean, I even Anthony Bourdain uh, raves about the pho in, in Vietnam because um, he shared a bowl with, uh, with President Obama. Um, so it's a, it's a communal opportunity or experience um, to be uh, in a place where you can just sit and share the food um, with strangers sometimes. Um, and that's, that's a lovely part. And I'm hoping to brush up a little bit my French um, this coming few weeks uh, so I can at least, you know, order, you know, food or order anything or find the bathroom uh, in, in Paris. But I think, I think it'll be okay. I mean, generally they're pretty nice, right? Um, but it's been, I went to France when I was 16. And then this, this is my, my second trip. Um, so we'll see how much it's changed. Either I'm going to, you know, learn new things or I'm just going to be overwhelmed with, you know, all the good stuff. So um, going to Grenoble, are you just going there for a week course or just a lesson? Just a course. Yeah, I, I had to apply and uh, the Cordon Bleu is not, not cheap no, to, go, to go there. Um, so I asked myself, I think it would be a great Mother's Day present. Um, so that's, that's what I did. Um, and it's, a, it's two days uh, of pastries and then a few days of cakes. Um, you know, I don't know how I'm going to do. I just, you know, I'm going to work really hard at it and, and see. I'm two just. Days. Just for the, the breads, and then you have the cakes, and then you have the um, sauces, I think, with that. So it's like a week. Oh. No, it's not, not too bad. Um, anyway, any questions? or I feel like I'm just kind of throwing at you random things of information um, and things I tell my girls all the time, and they're like, Mom, you talk too much. Um, so... Um, I'm still fluent in Vietnamese, um, although be it, it's got a little accent to it, right? You know, if they, they threw me back in Vietnam right now, I'm, I might um, stutter a little bit until I get used to it. Um, I've actually not been back to Vietnam since I left. Um, I've always wanted to go with my daughters, and the timing hasn't been right where, you know, we can get time off and, and go. But I made a plan, I made a plan because both girls are working um, that this next summer, where, wherever we are, I'm gonna go. And if they can go, then I'll buy them a ticket and we all can go together. Um, Cause I want to experience that with them. Um, you know, I, I couldn't tell you, you know, going back there, I'm sure it's, it's be brand new for me and the changes. Um, what I remember of Vietnam is, is just beautiful. Uh, we went to the beaches a lot, uh, to Da Nang, to Da Lac. Um, and, you know, when my parents came here to, we settled in Arlington, um, our vacations were Galveston. You know, it's the closest place we can get to a beach um, until we discover Florida. Um, now, you talk about groceries. My grandmother was a very smart woman. When we left the country, um, we had no idea where we'd we go. Would we go into the jungle? Would we go into some place we don't recognize the language or know the language or even the food? So my grandmother packed seeds. Um, wow, she, it was like, you know, something that you don't think about because it's survival, right? And I'm um, so she packed the seeds um, in, you know, our bags and the lining of our bags. Um, and then when we got here, my mother planted okra, tomatoes, um, and mint. Uh, it was, of course, mint so so easy to grow. But um, and then we we learned there's a place called Trader's Village <laughs> that we could buy chickens. We can buy little little baby chickens. And so we raised chickens in this little you know, duplex we lived, and, um, you know, we thought it was okay. She would slaughter the chickens, and it was, 
it was our food, but then, because we didn't have a car, we just thought, okay, we, you know, just eat what we grow, and, and then someone showed us or took us to a place called Safeway, and there was chicken already cut up and had no idea that you could do this. And then we could buy milk and, you know, we still didn't have a car. So we bought the groceries and walked 10 blocks home. And, you know, I carried the milk. It was kind of heavy because I'm like six years old. And, um, but, you know, we didn't have to grow or, or slaughter any chickens anymore after that. They became pets. Um, but uh, I mean, the adjustment of, you know, a immigrant or a refugee, um, if you have, you know, neighbors or friends, you know, be nice and be patient to them and uh, just share out. Um, we did a little event at the uh, community where the Afghans um, had moved to on the east side of town. Um, and the one thing that we, that we miss when we go to a new place is the food. I mean, basic staples, like where can we buy rice? My, my parents are like, you know, the rice at the, the store isn't the same rice that we're used to, the jasmine rice, where it's very aromatic. And I, I kind of saw that with, you know, the Afghanistan refugees. They didn't have the spices they need to give them a taste of home. So I went to Pindery's and I bought, 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 and we did these um, spice packets. And oh my gosh, I felt you know wonderful. I could share with them like here, you, this is. I looked it up, I googled it, and these are the spices that. And, and the families were so so grateful that they can at least now cook, um, you know, with the the familiar smells of their house. Um, I truly believe that food is the. The, the glue that binds any community, um, whether, you know, if it's Asian food, um, of course there's a very large Asian community in Arlington, um, but wherever you are, wherever community you live in, it's the food that really brings you together. Um, and this little restaurant I'll have on Magnolia is, is for that purpose. I may not you know, be a fine dining establishment. I may not uh, ever be a millionaire. <laughs> not that I want to be, but uh, you know, it's it's the purpose is to share that. Um, and one of the best things I think about the place too is that we'll be using it as an incubator for the next generation of chefs. So um, my business partner is a culinary instructor at Trimble Tech, and she has students. And what do students need? They need the experience. And what we're losing is the generational recipes that our grandmothers um, have, that our tia, that our abuela uh, have. And we're not teaching it to the next generation. Because um, I ask my students, hey, do you know how to make tamales? No, my grandmother never showed me, or you know, I just don't pay attention. And Gosh, there's uh, tons of recipes that you know families can that have and they should share with their kids. And so we're pulling, you know, chefs' knowledge and people in the community's knowledge, so that we can bring it to the pantry, bring it this this generational, I wouldn't say gap, but generational knowledge that we're going to lose if we don't share it. Um, so. I really appreciate you guys. I know I'm just rambling. That's so uh, great. Yeah. Thank you, Hal, yes. so much. Yeah. Uh, just real quick, we're going to wrap up. We're yes. going to do dessert after, but we're going to wrap up the program for our virtual audience. Uh, but I want to make sure that there were any other questions from our in-person participants today. Yeah. Any questions for Hal? Okay, well, then with that, I will, food. I will thank you very much, thank Hal, you. for showing us your, yes. uh, your culinary um, techniques and teaching our group here a little bit about how to do that. And uh, probably more importantly, um, just your personal stories that you have shared. Um, I think what, we, you know, what, what Hal said is you know, food is definitely a very common denominator regardless of what culture you, know, um, you, are, you affiliate with. It's something that brings everybody together, and um, 
I just thank you for sharing, again, your, your food and your stories and um, your, your insight and introspection. So thank you very much, Hal. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Well, you do have dessert. Um, it's in that big pot with the, behind the black ramekins. It's a mix of lychee, uh, coconut, and jackfruit. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with those, but lychee berries, um, they grow in clusters. Um, coconut, you know, but uh, jackfruit, they're humongous. They grow like this, and then you have to, like, break it open. But these are all um, from the Asian market. And I